From the idea that all small nations had the right to be free came the Easter Rising and its long and complex legacy and history. Today, on this 107th anniversary of the Easter Rising in Dublin, we are discussing the events that led to this climactic decision and the legacy and effects it had on the history of not only Britain and Ireland, but the West. The Easter Rising, also known as the Easter Rebellion, was an armed insurrection in Ireland during Easter week in April of 1916. The Rising was launched by Irish Republicans against the British rule in Ireland, with the aim of establishing an independent Irish Republic while the United Kingdom was fighting the First World War. It was the most significant uprising in Ireland since the Large Rebellion of 1798, and it was the first armed conflict of the Irish Revolutionary Period. Sixteen of the Rising's leaders were executed in the following month of May 1916. The nature of the executions and the subsequent political developments that would follow them, leading to increases in support for Irish independence in lieu of everything that had happened, followed shortly after. Organized by a seven-man military council of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, or the IRB, the Rising began in Easter Monday on the 24th of April, 1916, and it lasted for six long days. Members of the Irish Volunteers, led by a schoolmaster and Irish language activist Patrick Peirce, joined by the smaller Irish Citizen Army of James Connolly, and 200 women of Cumann na Mumban, seized strategically important buildings in Dublin and proclaimed the independence of the Irish Republic. That is what we will be discussing today. First and foremost, this is a complicated event with a complicated history, so I just hope that I will do its justice. Secondly, I apologize if I butcher any of the Irish names or places, as it is quite a complex language. So, with that, I am Shieldbro6 for the History Armada, and I will be your guide with this weekly dose of history. Let us begin with the background of the Rising. The Acts of Union in 1800 united the Kingdom of Great Britain and the Kingdom of Ireland as the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland in one entity, abolishing the Irish Parliament and giving Ireland representation in the British Parliament instead. From early on, many Irish nationalists opposed the Union and the continued lack of adequate political representation amongst the British Parliament. Along with the British government's handling of Ireland and the Irish people, particularly the Great Irish Famine, opposition took various forms, constitutional, social, and revolutionary. The Irish Home Rule movement sought to achieve self-government for Ireland within the United Kingdom. In 1886, the Irish Parliamentary Party under Charles Stuart Parnell succeeded in having the first Home Rule Bill introduced to the British Parliament, but it was defeated. The second Home Rule Bill of 1893 was passed by the House of Commons, but rejected by the House of Lords. After the death of Parnell, younger and more radical nationalists became disillusioned with parliamentary politics and turned towards more extreme forms of separatism from the British. The Gaelic Athletic Association, the Gaelic League, and the cultural revival under W.B. Yeats and Augusta Lady Gregory, together with the new political thinking of Arthur Griffith, expressed in his newspaper Sinn Féin, and organizations such as the National Council and the Sinn Féin League, led many Irish people to identify with the idea of an independent Gaelic Ireland. This was sometimes referred to by the generic term Sinn Féin with the British authorities using it as a collective noun for Republicans and advanced nationalists leaping and gathering them under this one blanket term. The third Home Rule Bill was introduced by British Liberal Prime Minister H. H. Asquith in 1912. Irish Unionists, who were overwhelmingly Protestant, opposed it as they did not want to be ruled by the Catholic-dominated Irish government. 
Led by Sir Edward Carson and James Craig, they formed the Ulster Volunteers, the UVF, in January 1913. In response to this, Irish nationalists formed a rival paramilitary group, the Irish Volunteers, in November of 1913. The Irish Republican Brotherhood, the IRB, was a driving force behind the Irish Volunteers and attempted to control it and steer it in a certain direction that would be beneficial for the separatism. Its leader was Owen McNeill, who was not an IRB member. The Irish Volunteers' stated goal was, quote, to secure and to maintain the rights and liberties common to all the people of Ireland, end quote. It included people with a range of political views and was open to all able-bodied Irishmen without distinction of creed, politics, or social grouping. Another militant group that rose during this time was the Irish Citizen Army, who would be very fundamental during the Easter Rebellion. And it was formed by trade unionists as a result of the Dublin lockout of that year. British Army officers threatened to resign if they were ordered to take action against the UVF. When the Irish volunteers smuggled rifles into Dublin, the British Army attempted to stop them and shot into a crowd of civilians. By 1914, Ireland seemed to be on the brink of a civil war. This seemed to be averted in August of that year by the outbreak of the First World War, or the Great War, and Ireland's involvement in it due to the British. Nevertheless, on the 18th of September 1914, the Government of Ireland Act 1914 was enacted and placed on the statute book, but the Suspensory Act was passed at the same time which deferred Irish home rule for one year, with powers for it to be suspended for further periods of six months at a time, so long as the war continued. Because remember, it was still widely believed that World War I would be over within a few months, so they did not believe that the Irish home rule would be put off for long. On the 14th of September, 1915, an order in council was made under the Suspensory Act to suspend the Government of Ireland Act until the 18th of March, 1916. Another such order was made on the 29th of February, 1916, suspending the act for another six months to much outrage and grumblings. With that background, let us discuss the plans to rise. The Supreme Council of the IRB met on the 5th of September, 1914, just over a month after the British government had declared war on Germany. You can remember, World War I is raging. At this meeting, they decided to stage an uprising before the war ended and to secure help from Germany. Responsibility for the planning of the rising was given to Tom Clark and Sean McDarmada. The Irish Volunteers, the smaller of the two forces, resulting from the September 1914 split over the support for the British war effort, set up a headquarters staff that included Patrick Peirce, as Director of Military Organization, Joseph Plunkett as a Director of Military Operations, and Thomas B McDonough as Director of Training, and Omen Kinnett was later added as Director of Communications. In May 1915, Clark and McDonough established a military committee or military council within the IRB consisting of Peirce, Plunkett, and Kint to draw up plans for a rising. Clark and McDarmada joined it shortly after it was established. With this, although the volunteer and the IRB leaders were not against a rising in principle, they were of the opinion that it was not the opportune moment to do so. Because to do so, you know, prematurely would be the undoing of such an agreement and such an action. And the military council was able to promote its own policies and personal independently of both the volunteer executive and the IRB executive. Volunteer chief of staff Owen McNeil supported a rising only if the British government attempted to suppress the volunteers or introduce conscription into Ireland. And if such a rising had some chance of success, IRB president Dennis McCullough and prominent IRB member Bulmer Hobson held similar views of this event. The military council kept its plan secret so as to prevent the British authorities from learning of any such plans. They did not want word getting out 
prematurely before they had time to act. The IRB members held office rank in the volunteers throughout the country and took their orders from the military council, not from McNeil. So following this and looking forward to the future that was but a short term off and shortly after the outbreak of World War I, Roger Casement and Clan Nagel leader John Devoy met the German ambassador to the United States, Johann Heinrich von Bernstorff, to discuss German backing for an uprising. Casement went to Germany and began negotiations with the German government and military. He persuaded the Germans to announce their support for Irish independence in the November of 1914. Casement also attempted to recruit an Irish brigade made up of Irish prisoners of war, which, be, which would be armed and sent to Ireland to join the uprising. However, only 56 men out of those prisoners of war volunteered. Plunkett joined Casement in Germany the following year. Together, Plunkett and Casement presented a plan known as the Ireland Report in which a German expeditionary force would land on the west coast of Ireland while a rising in Dublin diverted the British forces so that the Germans, with the help of the local volunteers, could secure a line at the River Shannon before advancing on the capital. The German military, outer, they just utterly rejected this plan, but they did agree to ship arms and ammunition to the volunteers to help with the rising. So the plans to rise started to consolidate here. James Connolly, head of the Irish Citizen Army, a group of armed socialist trade union like I mentioned earlier, were unaware of the IRB's plans and dealings, and they had threatened to start a rebellion on his own if the other parties failed to act. If they had done it alone, the IRB and the volunteers would possibly have come to their aid. However, the IRB leaders met with Connolly in January 1916 and convinced him to join forces with them. They agreed that they would launch a rising together at Easter and made Connolly the sixth member of the military council. Thomas McDonough would later become the seventh and final member of this council. The death of the old Fenian leader Jeremiah O'Donovan Rosa in New York in August of 1915 was an opportunity to mount a spectacular demonstration. His body was sent to Ireland for burial at Glasnevin Cemetery, and there was volunteers in charge of the arrangements. Huge crowds lined the route and gathered at the graveside. Hearst even made a dramatic funeral orientation, and his orientation, it, it really rallied the people. It was a rallying call for all Republicans, which ended with these words, quote, Ireland unfree shall never be at peace, end quote. And with that, they felt that they had the backing of the people for what they were planning. So, that brings us to the prepping of the fire. In early April, Hearst issued orders to the Irish volunteers for three days of parades and maneuvers, beginning on Easter Sunday. He had the authority to do this as the volunteers director of organization. The idea was that the IRB members within the organization would know these were orders to begin the rising, while men such as McNeil and the British authorities would take it at face value. On the 9th of April, the German Navy dispatched the SS Libau from County Kerry, disguised as a Norwegian ship, and it was loaded with 20,000 rifles, 1 million rounds of ammunition, and explosives. Casement also left for Ireland aboard the German submarine the U-19. He was disappointed with the level of support offered by the Germans, and he intended to stop or at least postpone the rising until they could gather more support. On the Wednesday of the 19th of April, Alderman Tom Kelly, a Sinn Féin member of Dublin Corporation, read out at a meeting of the corporation a document prepared. It was, it was supposedly a leaked document from Dublin Castle. So he was using this kind of claiming, hey, look what I found from Dublin Ca Castle. You guys need to listen up. Like, this is really big stuff. And it claimed to have detailing plans by the British authorities to shortly arrest leaders of the Irish Volunteers, Sinn Féin, and the Gaelic League and occupy their premises and grounds. Although the British authorities said that the, quote, as it became known, castle document was fake, McNeil ordered the Volunteers to prepare to resist. 
Unbeknownst to McNeil, the document had been forged by the military council to persuade moderates of the need for a planned uprising. It was an edited version of a real document outlining British plans in the event of needed conscription in Ireland. That same day, the military council informed the senior volunteer officers that the rising would begin on Easter Sunday. However, it chose not to inform the rank and file and the moderates, such as McNeil, until the last minute for preparations. With that, it followed that they would learn of the uprising and British naval intelligence had been aware of the armed shipment and casement's return, as well as the Easter date for the rising through radio messages between Germany and its embassy in the United States that were intercepted by the Royal Navy and deciphered by the Admiralty. So with their plans being known, unbeknownst to them, they began to look forward to the announcement of their actions. It was decided to postpone action until Easter Monday, and in the meantime, Nathan telegraphed the Chief Secretary Augustine Burrell in London seeking his approval because Nathan, as he had con conferred with the Lord Lieutenant Lord Wilburn, had decided he had basically proposed that he wanted to raid Liberty Hall, which was his headquarters, which was headquarters of the Citizen Army. So they wanted to go in and insist and just to get a wholesale arrest of leaders. So since they had caught these Irish plans, they had this Matthew Nathan, who was Sir Matthew Nathan, had basically taken it upon himself to convince Lord Lieutenant Lord Wimburn, as well as the Admiralty and those in London, such as the Chief Secretary, that it was needed to just go in and arrest. They wanted to go basically, as you know, go in there, kick the door open, arrest all the leaders, and seize them all there at the same time. But like I said, they had to get the Chief Secretary Augustine Burrell's permission in London for them to be able to do this. But by the time Burrell cabled his reply authorizing such action, it was already noon on Monday, the 24th of April 1916, and the rising had already begun, so they missed their chance to go in and seize the leaders. On the morning of the Easter Sunday, the 23rd of April, the Military Council met at Liberty Hall to discuss what to do in light of McNeil's countermanding order. They decided that the Rising would go ahead the following day, Easter Monday, and that the Irish Volunteers and the Irish Citizen Army would go into action as one unit together, brothers in arms, known as the Army of the Irish Republic. They elected Peirce as President of the Irish Republic, and also as Commander-in-Chief of the Army, and Connolly became command Commandant of the Dublin Brigade. Messengers were then sent to all units informing them of the new orders and the new organization. On the left of the screen, you can see this order that was given out claiming the, uh, the provisional government of the Irish Republic to the people of Ireland. So, with that, the fire was prepped and we saw the rising in Dublin. On the Monday, March, sorry, April 24th, about 1,200 members of the Irish Volunteers and the Irish Citizen Army mustered together as the Army of the Irish Republic, and they gathered together at several locations in central Dublin. Among them were members of the all-female Cumin na Mumbalum, some wore Irish Volunteer and Citizen Army uniforms, while others wore civilian clothes with a yellow Irish Volunteer armband, military hats, and bandoliers. They were armed mostly with rifles, such as the 1871 Mausers, but they were also armed with shotguns, revolvers, a few Mauser C96 semi-automatic pistols, and hand grenades. The number of volunteers who mobilized was much smaller than expected. This was due to McNeil's countermanding orders and the fact that the new orders had been sent so soon beforehand. However, several hundred volunteers joined the rising after it began pouring in to support what had already begun. Shortly after midday, the rebels began to seize important sites in central Dublin. The rebels' plan was to hold su Dublin city center, the square. This was a large oval-shaped area bounded by two canals, the Grand to the south and the Royal, Royal to the north, with the river Liffey running through the middle. So they were going to try and hold this oval. On the southern and western edges of this district were five British army barracks. 
most of the rebels' positions had been chosen to defend against counterattacks from these barracks. The rebels took the positions with ease. Civilians were evacuated and policemen were ejected or taken prisoner. Windows and doors were barricaded, food and supplies were secured, and first aid posts were set up. Barricades were erected on the streets to hinder British Army movement and stop any vehicular movement. A joint force of about 400 volunteers and Citizen Army gathered at Liberty Hall under the command of Commandant James Connolly. This was to be the Headquarters Battalion, and it also included Commander-in-Chief Patrick Purse, as well as Tom Clark, Sean McDermada, and Joseph Plunkett. They marched to the General Post Office on O'Connell Street, Dublin's main thoroughfare, occupied the building, and hoisted two Republican flags. One, such as the one on the left of your screen, and the other one being the tricolor of the green, white, and orange. They took over also a wireless telegraph station and sent out a radio broadcast in Morse code, announcing that the Irish Republic had been declared. This was the first official radio broadcast in Ireland. Elsewhere, some of the headquarters battalion under Michael Mellon occupied St. Stephen's Green. You can see here on your screen now the Easter Rising of 1916. The circles are the volunteer strong points and the squares are the British strong points. And you can see them here as they positioned along the river. As well as you can see the gunboat Helga and the different streets that they were using as well as the buildings they were occupying. On the north there, next to the GPO, you can see the GPO I was talking about and Liberty Hall. So, after taking these positions, the headquarters battalion under Michael Mellon occupied St. Stephen's Green, like I said, and they dug trenches and barricaded the surrounding roads. The 1st Battalion, under Edward Ned Daly, occupied the four courts and surrounding buildings, while a company under Sean Houston occupied the Mendicity Institution across the River Liffey from the four courts. The 2nd Battalion, under Thomas McDonough, occupied Jacob's Biscuit Factory. The 3rd Battalion, under Emin uh, de Valera, occupied Boland's Mill and surrounding buildings. The 4th Battalion, under Yeoman Kennett, occupied the South Dublin Union and the distillery on Marrowbone Lane. From each of these garrisons, small units of rebels established outposts in the surrounding area. The rebels also attempted to cut transport and commu communication links, as well as they erected roadblocks. They took control of various bridges and cut telephone and telegraph wires, hoping that it would slow down any British response. Westland Row and Harcourt Street railway stations were also occupied, though that latter only being briefly. The railway line was cut at Fairview and the line was damaged by bombs at Amiens Street, Broadstone, Kingsbridge, and Lansdowne Road. Around midday, a small team of volunteers and Fianna Erin members swiftly captured the magazine fort in the Phoenix Park and disarmed the guards there. The goal was to siege weapons and blow up the ammunition store there to signal the rising had begun. They seized weapons and planted explosives, but the blast was not loud enough to be heard across the city. The 23-year-old son of the fort's commander was fatally shot when he ran away to try and raise the alarm. A contingent under Sean Connolly occupied Dublin City Hall and the adjacent buildings. They attempted to seize neighboring Dublin Castle, the heart of British rule in Ireland, but as they approached the gate, a lone and unarmed police sentry, James O'Brien, attempted to stop them and was shot dead by Connolly. According to some accounts, he was the first casualty of the Rising. The rebels overpowered the soldiers at the guardroom, but failed to press any further. The British Army's chief intelligence officer, Major Ivan Price, fired on the rebels, while the Undersecretary for Ireland, Sir Matthew Nathan, who I had spoke of earlier, helped to shut the castle gates. Unbeknownst to the rebels, the castle was lightly guarded and could have been taken with ease, but they thought it was more heavily guarded and they did not want to press their numbers. The rebels instead laid siege to the castle from City Hall. Fierce fighting erupted there after British reinforcements began to arrive, so they essentially missed their window for opportunity there again. The rebels on the roof exchanged fire with the soldiers on the street, and Sean Connolly was shot dead by a sniper, becoming the first rebel casualty of the Rising. 
By the following morning, British forces had recaptured City Hall and taken the remaining rebels prisoner. The rebels did not attempt to take some other key locations, notably being Trinity College in the heart of the city center and defended by only a, a handful of armed Unionist students. Failed to capture the telephone exchange in Crone Alley, left communications in the hands of the government with GPO staff, quickly repairing telephone wires that had been cut down by the rebels. Their communications were quickly back up. The failure to occupy these strategic locations was attributed to the lack of manpower. In at least two incidents at Jacobs and Stevens Green, the volunteers and citizen army shot dead civilians trying to attack or dismantle their barricades. Elsewhere, they hit civilians with their rifle butts to drive them off. The British military were caught totally unprepared by the rising and the response of the first day was generally uncoordinated. Two squadrons of British cavalry were sent to investigate what was happening. They took fire and casualties from the rebel forces at the GPO and at the Four Courts. As one troop passed Nelson's Pillar, the rebels opened fire from the GPO, killing three of the cavalrymen and two of their horses. And they also fatally wounded a fourth man. The cavalrymen then retreated and were withdrawn to the barracks. On Mount Street, a group of volunteer training corps men stumbled upon the rebel position and four were killed before they even reached Beggar's Bush Barracks. The only substantial combat of the first day of the Rising took place at the South Dublin Union, where a picket from the Royal Irish Regiment encountered an outpost at Yeoman Kennett's force at the northwestern corner of the South Dublin Union. The British troops, after taking some casualties, managed to regroup and consolidate and launch several assaults on the held position before they forced their way inside, and the small rebel force in the tin huts at the eastern end of the Union were forced to surrender. However, the Union complex as a whole remained within rebel hands. A nurse in uniform, Margaret Coe, was shot dead by British soldiers at the Union. She is believed to have been the first civilian killed in the Rising. Three unarmed Dublin Metropolitan Police were shot dead on the first dead of the Rising, and their commissioner pulled them off the streets. Partly as a result of the, the police withdrawal, a wave of looting broke out in the city center, especially in the area of O'Connell Street, still officially named Sackville Street at the time. So, that was just the first day of the Rising. Eventually, we would go on to fight Tuesday and Wednesday where we would see martial law put into place Tuesday evening and they handed over civil power to Brigadier General William Lowe. We saw a large British force come upon Dublin Castle and unsure of the size of the force he was up against and with only 1269 troops in the city when he arrived from the Kuro camp in the early hours of Tuesday, City Hall was taken from the rebel unit that had attacked Dublin Castle on Tuesday morning. So. He had 1,269, but by the end of the week, British strengths stood at over 16,000 men. Their firepower was provided by field artillery, which they positioned on the north side of the city at Pipsboro and at Trinity College, as well as a patrol vessel Helga, which was equipped as a gunboat. And the guns at the college and the Helga gunboat shelled Liberty Hall and Trinity College, and they began to fire on rebel positions, greatly decimating the preparations and the kind of barricades that had been put into place. On Wednesday morning, hundreds of British troops encircled the Mendicity Institution, which was what re occupied by this point only by 26 volunteers and Sean Houston. British troops advanced on the building, supported by snipers and machine gun fire, but the volunteers did put up stiff resistance. Eventually, however, the troops got close enough to hurl grenades into the building, some of which the rebels threw back. Exhausted and almost out of ammunition, Houston's men became the first rebel position to surrender. So Wednesday, we see the first surrender. On Wednesday, Lenhannel Barracks on Constitution Hall was burnt down under the orders of Commandant Edward Dolly to prevent its reoccupation by the British. But more than 1,000 Sherwood Forestiers 
were reportedly caught in a crossfire trying to ac cross the canal, and 17 volunteers were able to severely disrupt the British advance. And they were uh, reportedly killing or wounding as many as 240 British men. That brings us to Thursday. The rebel position at the South Dublin Union, site of present-day St. James Hospital, and Marrowbone Lane, further west along the canal, also inflicted heavy losses on the British troops. The South Dublin Union was a large complex of buildings that were viciously held, and there was vicious fighting around and inside of the buildings. Cathal Brugge, a rebel officer, distinguished himself in this action, and he was badly wounded. By the end of the week, the British had taken some of the buildings in the Union, but others remained in rebel hands. British troops also took casualties in unsuccessful frontal assaults on the distillery. The third major scene of fighting during the week in the area of North King Street, north of the Four Courts, also occurred at this time. The rebels had established strong outposts in this area, occupying numerous small buildings and barricading the streets. From Thursday until Saturday, the British made repeated attempts to capture the area, in what was some of the fiercest fighting of the Rising. As the troops moved in, the rebels continually opened fire from windows and from behind chimneys and barricades such as pictured on the left of your screen. At one point, a platoon led by Major Shepard made a bayonet charge on one of the barricades, but they were cut down by the rebel fire. The British employed machine guns at this time and attempted to avoid direct fire by using makeshift armored trucks and by mouse holing through the inside walls of terraced houses to get near the rebel positions. By the time the rebel headquarters surrendered on Saturday, the South Staffordshire Regiment under Colonel Taylor had advanced only 150 yards, one and a half football fields, 140 meters down the street at the cost of 11 dead, 28 wounded, and possibly more. The, un the enraged British troops broke into the houses along the street and shot or bayoneted 15 unarmed male civilians whom they accused of being rebel fighters. Elsewhere, at the Portobello bar barracks, an officer named Bowen Colthurst summa summarily executed six civilians, including the pacifist nationalist activist Francis Sheafy Skeffington, and these instances of British troops killing Irish civilians would later be held with high controversy throughout Ireland and much of Britain. But, with the fighting ending and the headquarters garrison at the GPO being forced to evacuate after days of shelling, that is when we saw a major fire break out caused by the shells and it spread throughout all of the GPO. Conley had been incapacitated by a bullet wound to the ankle and had passed command onto Purse. The O. Rahili was killed in a sortie from the GPO. They tunneled through the walls in the neighboring buildings in order to evacuate the post office without coming under fire and took up a new position on the 16th of Moore Street. The young Sean McCollum was later given military command and planned a breakout, but Purse realized that this plan would lead to further loss of civilian life. On the Saturday, 29th of April, from his new headquarters, Purse issued an order for all companies to surrender. Purse surrendered unconditionally to Brigadier General Lowe. The surrender document read as follows. Quote, In order to prevent the further slaughter of Dublin citizens and in hope of saving the lives of our followers, we now are surrounded and hopelessly outnumbered. The members of the provisional government present at headquarters have agreed to an unconditional surrender and the commandants of the various districts in the city and the county will order their commands to lay down arms." End quote. The other post surrendered only after Purse's surrender order, carried by nurse Elizabeth O'Farrell, had reached them. Sporadic fighting, therefore, continued without stop until Sunday, when word of the surrender was therefore given throughout the rest of the rebel garrison. Command of British forces had passed from Lowe to General John Maxwell, who arrived in Dublin just in time to take the surrender. Maxwell was made temporary military governor of 
Ireland. But that was not the end entirely. Following the surrender, there were risings outside of the, either Dublin or the county. These risings took place during and after the surrender of Dublin. Irish volunteer units mobilized on Easter Sunday in several places outside of Dublin, but because of Owen McNeil's countermanding order, most of them returned home without actually fighting. In addition, because of the interception of the German arms aboard the ships, the provisional volunteer units were very poorly armed. In the south, around 1,200 volunteers, commanded by Thomas McCurtain, mustered on the Sunday in Cork, but they dispersed on Wednesday after receiving nine contradictory orders by dispatch from the volunteer leaders in Dublin. At their Shear Street headquarters, some of the volunteers engaged in a standoff with British forces. Much to the dismay and anger of many of these volunteers, Matt Curtin, under pressure from the Catholic clergy, agreed to surrender his men's arms to the British. The only violence in Cork occurred when the RIC attempted to raid the home of the Kent family. The Kent brothers, who were volunteers, engaged in a three-hour firefight with the RIC. An RIC officer and one of the brothers were killed in the exchange, while the other brother was later executed after his capture. In the north, volunteer companies were mobilized in County Tyrone at Colesland, including 132 men from Belfast, led by the IRB president Dennis McCullough, and Carrickmore, under the leadership of Patrick McCartan. They also mobilized at Creeslow, County Donegal, until Daniel Kelly and James McNutton arrived and then took over control. However, in part because of the confusion caused by the countermanding orders, the volunteers in these locations dispersed without ever fighting. We also saw movements in Fingal, North County, Dublin, with about 60 volunteers mobilizing near Swords. They belonged to the 5th Battalion of the Dublin Brigade, known as the Fingal Battalion, but the Fingal Battalion's tactics during the Rising foreshadowed those of the IRA during the War of Independence because they made a very guerrilla warfare of it. They took very interesting operations and they, do, they did things like damaging rail lanes, derailing a cattle train, bombing troops, seizing weapons, guerrilla tactics throughout the hills and glens, and they became what would become the idea of the fighting tactics for the IRA. Volunteer contingents also mobilized near in counties Meath and Louth, but proved unable to link up with the North Dublin until after it had surrendered. In County Louth, volunteers shot dead an RIC man near the village at Castle Bellingham on the 24th of April. In an incident in which 15 RIC men were also taken prisoner. We also saw rising an Enniscorthy, Galway, Limerick, and Clare. In County Limerick, 300 Irish volunteers assembled at Glenquin Castle near Killady, but they did not take any military action. We saw several also very important risings. With Enniscorthy, they did move out, and the British assembled a column of 1,000 soldiers and two field guns and a 4.7 inch naval gun to fight this 1,000 rebels that had been mobilized from Enniscorthy. On Sunday, the British sent messengers to Enniscorthy informing the rebels of Percy's surrender order. However, the volunteer officers were skeptical. Two of them were escorted by the British to Arbor Hill Prison, where Percy confirmed the surrender order, and therefore, the 1,000 rebels surrendered. Galway saw 600 to 700 volunteers mobilized on Tuesday under Liam Mellows. His plan was to, quote, bottle up the British garrison and divert the British from concentrating on Dublin. However, his men were poorly armed, having only 25 rifles, 60 revolvers, 300 shotguns, and a handful of homemade grenades to go with the 600 to 700 volunteers. The rest of them had pikes, and they took up position near Athenry. There was also a skirmish between rebels and an RIC mobile patrol at Carnmore Crossroads. A constable was shot dead after he had called the rebels, Surrender boys, I know ye all, I know ye all are. But... He was shot dead, and the rebels continued in the countryside on the northeastern edge of Galway. The rebels retreated southeast to Moyodi, an abandoned country house and estate, 
From here, they set up lookout posts and sent out scouting patrols. On Friday, the HMS Gloucester landed 200 Royal Marines and began shelling the countryside near the rebel position. The rebels retreated further south to Lime Park, another abandoned country house. Deeming the situation to be hopeless, they dispersed on Saturday morning, scattering to the countryside and many went home and were arrested following the surrender of the Rising, while others, including Mellows, went on the run. By the time British reinforcements arrived in the west, the Rising there had already disintegrated. This being here an example top left of the kind of familiar bond that we would see within the Rising. In County Clare, Michael Brennan marched with 100 volunteers, and oftentimes it was a family affair. Brothers, dads and sons uniting together in these volunteer forces to march on the British. In the bottom right, you can see the Daily Express and its take on the crazy revolt, as it says, and the Irish rebellion spreading throughout the countryside. Outbreaks in the West and South, it says, street fighting in Dublin, and it also talks about uh, a bit about World War One, and it talks about the spreading of this rebellion to the other counties and cities that I have just described to you. With these risings, both in Dublin and outside of Dublin, the Easter Rising resulted in at least 485 deaths according to the Glasnevin Trust. Of those killed, 260 were civilians. 120, about 26% of the deaths, were UK forces and about 82 or 16 percent were Irish rebel forces and 17 or about 4 percent were police. More than 2,600 were wounded, including at least 2,200 civilians and rebels and at least 370 British soldiers and 29 policemen. All 16 police fatalities and 22 of the British soldiers killed were Irishmen. About 40 of those killed were children 17, under 17 years old four of whom were members of the rebel forces. So on the left of your screen, you can see a monument that was erected in memory of the casualties. And there was actually 35 of these casualties were from Irish regiments in the UK forces. And we see a lot of bloodshed. However, according to the historian, Fergal McGarry, the rebels attempted to avoid needless bloodshed, and Desmond Ryan stated that the volunteers were told to, quote, no fire, uh, sorry, they were told, quote, no firing was to take place except under orders or to repel attacks. So they were not on the offensive, they were on the defensive here. And aside from the engagement at Ashbourne, policemen and unarmed soldiers were not systematically targeted, and a large group of policemen were allowed to stand at Nelson's Pillar throughout Monday. McGarry writes that the Irish citizen army, however, were more ruthless than the volunteers when it came to the shooting of policemen, and he attributes this to the acrimonious legacy of the Dublin lockout. The vast majority of the Irish casualties were buried in Glasnevin Cemetery in the aftermath of the fighting. British families that came to Dublin Castle in the May of 1916 to reclaim the bodies of British soldiers were allowed to do so and funerals were arranged. Soldiers whose bodies were not claimed were given military funerals at Grange Gamorman Military Cemetery. So the major part of this was not necessarily the rising itself, but the aftermath of the rising. General Maxwell quickly signaled his intention to arrest all danger dangerous Sinn Feiners and including those who have taken an active part in the movement, although not in the present rebellion. So even if you were not part of the Rising, but you were a known Sinn Féin member, you were going to be arrested. As well as, he made it very clear that he intended to execute those who were deemed in charge of this Rising. Among them were the seriously wounded Connolly, who was shot while tied to a chair because of his shattered ankle. Maxwell stated that only the, quote, ringlingers and those proven to have committed cold-blooded murder would be executed. However, the evidence presented was weak, and some of those executed were not leaders and did not kill anyone. Willie Purse described himself as a, quote, personal attaché to my brother Patrick Purse. John McBride had not even been aware of the Rising until it began, but had fought against the British in the Boer War 15 years before. Thomas Kent did not come out at all, and he was executed for the killing of a police officer during the raid on his house 
the week after the rising. The most prominent leader to escape execution was Eumann de Valera, commandant of the 3rd Battalion, who did so partly because of his American birth. Most of the executions took place over a 10 day period, from the 3rd of May to the 12th of May. On the 3rd of May, we saw the execution of Patrick Peirce, Thomas McDonough, and Thomas Clark. On the 4th of May, Joseph Plunkett, William Peirce, Edward Daly, and Michael O'Hanrana were executed. May 5th, we saw John McBride. May 8th, Eumann Kent, Michael Mallon, Sean Houston, and Con Colbert were all executed. And on May 12th, they followed by James Connolly and Sean McDermott. As the executions went on, the Irish public grew increasingly hostile towards the British. This is the big part. Yes, there was an uprising, but it had not been fully sanctioned by the people. Not everyone was a Sinn Féiner or in favor of a bloody rising or a rising at all. But as more and more Irishmen and more and more leaders were summarily executed, it became more and more sympathetic to the rebels, and the people became more and more on the side of the rebels. After the first three execution, John Redmond, leader of the moderate Irish Parliamentary Party, said in the British Parliament that the rising, quote, happily seems to be over and it has been dealt with with firmness, which was not only right, but it was the duty of the government to do so and deal with it, end quote. However, he urged the government, quote, not to show undue hardship or severity to the great masses of those who are implicated, end quote. As the executions continued, Redmond pleaded with Asquith to stop them, warning that if more executions took place in Ireland, the position will become impossible for any constitutional party to hold. Ulster Unionist Party leader Edward Carson expressed similar views, and this was not a moderate, this was a unionist. He said that Redmond's deputy, John Dillon, made an impassioned speech in Parliament as well, saying, quote, Thousands of people who 10 days ago were bitterly opposed to the whole of the Sinn Féin movement and to the rebellion are now becoming infuriated against the government on account of these executions. End quote. He said, it is not murders who are being executed. It is insurgents who have fought a clean fight, a brave fight, however misguided. Dylan was heckled by Eng English MPs and the British government itself had also become concerned at the reaction to the executions. Because they were summarily executing them, it was sowing the seeds for dissent and sowing the seeds of lasting trouble in Ireland. In fact, we saw several court martials be carried out due to the way that the executions were carried out. Asquith had warned Maxwell that, quote, a large number of executions would therefore sow the seeds of lasting trouble in Ireland, end quote. And he was right. Because we would see the Irish... So the Irish War of Independence, essentially. We would see the Irish Civil War, and then we would see the Troubles. So he was entirely correct. Even now, you can hear rebel songs and poems written about the leaders of 16 being executed. Furthermore, there was a prison camp established at Frangach, and many British atrocities took place. The Royal Commission was set up to inquire into the causes of the Rising, although they had little success there, and was recalled to London by Asquith. And there was a large reaction of the Dublin public. At first, many Dubliners were bewildered by the outbreak of the Rising. James Stevens, who was in Dublin during the week, thought none of these people were prepared for insurrection. The thing had sprung on them so suddenly they were unable to take sides. They had not been aware. So when it broke out, citizens were torn on who to support. And often we saw citizens either just hiding utterly from both sides or picking rapidly a side. And there was a separation of women and a separation of money by the British government whose husbands and sons were fighting in the British army in the First World War. And there were also hostilities from the Unionists. Supporters of the Irish Parliamentary Party also felt the rebellion was a betrayal of their party. When occupying positions in the South Dublin Union and Jacob's Factory, the rebels got involved in physical confrontations with civilians who tried to tear down the rebel barricades like I told you earlier. Volunteers shot and clubbed a number of civilians, and civilians were quite weary and scarred by this. However, some Dubliners expressed support for the rebels, 
and that support only grew as the executions and atrocities continued to take place. The aftermath of the Rising, and in particular the British reaction to it, helped sway a large section of Irish nationalist opinions away from hostility or ambulance and towards support for the rebels in the Easter of 1916 and for Sinn Féin. Dublin businessman and Quaker James G. Douglas, for example, here too a home ruler, wrote that his political outlook changed radically during the course of the Rising because of the British military occupation of Dublin City, and that he became convinced that parliamentary methods would not be enough to expel the British from Ireland. So with this, we see it being often remembered as with this mural here. We saw with the shifting of the opinion of the public, we also saw the rise of Sinn Féin. A meeting called by Count Plunkett on the 19th of April 1917 led to the formation of a broad political movement under the banner of Sinn Féin, which was formalized at the Sinn Féin Ard Face on October 25th, 1917. The conscription crisis of 1918 further intensified public support for Sinn Féin before the general elections to the British Parliament on December 14th, 1918. This election resulted in a landslide victory for Sinn Féin, winning 73 seats out of the 105 available, whose members of parliament gathered in Dublin on January 21st, 1919 to form Dal Erin and adopted the Declaration of Independence. So, while the rising itself may have been a failure due to the the quick put down of it after a week and the execution of its leaders, we saw the gathering of support, the rallying behind Sinn Féin, and the utter shift in support of separation from the United Kingdom. So the legacy and the aftermath is really, really the important part that we take away from the Easter Rising of 1916. Yes, the Rising itself is very important, but it was the it was essentially the flame on the powder barrel that would set off the explosion for independence. And this has been remembered for a long time in a lot of different ways. Poems, songs, commemorative coins, murals, even ceremonies taking place every year on this day in remembrance of this event. So, I would like to say thank you. I know it was a long one as we dove into the ba the background, the buildup, and then the actual fighting of the rising. But again, the most important part is what came in the legacy and aftermath with the rising of Sinn Féin and the unity of most of the Irish people. So I hope you enjoyed today's day weekly dose of history. As always, I am Shieldbro6. For the history armada i hope you learned a little bit about what the easter rising was and why it was important for the history of great britain and ireland so until the next video as always i am shilbro6 chucky arlach